Welcome back to Keep It Fictional, the book podcast from Port Moody Public Library. I'm your host today, Al, and I'm joined today by my book friends, Emma, Virginia, and Corrine. So it's February, and here at Keep It Fictional, we are very excited to celebrate Black History Month. This month has been set aside since 1976 as a time to remember, honor, and celebrate the contributions of Black people to history and culture. Today, we're going to spotlight some Black creators, and I'm excited to see what my book friends have in store for us. So why don't we start today with Virginia? Virginia, what have you got for us? All right. I hope book friends, I hope listeners, you are ready for some banana pansness because that's what I've got for you like every other day. Um, the book that I read for today is Parasol Against the Axe by Helen Oyayami. Oyayami is an author that Fiona talked about before on the show when she talked about gingerbread in our festive read episode. And she has been one of my one day I'm going to read you offers for years. So as one of my reading goals this year, I'm going to tackle that list. And the hype is definitely well deserved. And to be perfectly honest, I also picked this book up really because of the title. <laughs> Something about that line, Parasol, verse against the X, just really makes me smile. So um, this is a book that is coming out in a few weeks in March, on March 5th. Um, so a disclaimer that the version that I read and will be talking about is the advanced copy. So there may or may not be discrepancies from the final published book. Um, so just want to make a note about that. So what is this book about? What is this book about indeed? Um, I'm going to like summarize it as three ex-best friends who are in some sort of willing slash unwilling reunion of sorts. And a sentient city that narrates the story and has a lot of feelings about who gets to stay and who gets to go in the city. And a book that absolutely refuses to stay the same. You know you have a special book in hand and you know you're going to be in for a wild ride, not just because of the reputation of Oyayami, of course, but also when you have a first chapter and what seems to be a city and Prague in this case, reacting and responding to bad Yelp reviews of itself. Here we meet Hiro Tojosoa. And how do you describe Hiro? Well, it's possible to liken her most frequent facial expression to the red receipt that kills a conversation thread or a thumbs up emoji sent in response to a confession of love. I just love that description of a character so, so, so much. That's really all I need to know about Hero. But Hero has made a last-minute decision to attend her ex-besties Sophie's bachelorette party in Prague. Now, Hero really doesn't really know why she's going, but she is. And because she has a very complicated past with Sophie and with one of their other best friends, Thea, who is definitely not coming to the party. But she's here, and because she replies late to this whole party, she's staying in a different B&B, but she still tried her best to participate in all the activities and festivities that has been planned for this week. But really, Hiro is also okay just maybe just staying in her room and maybe reading a book, the book that her son Jerome has given to her special for this tri trip. And the book is called Paradoxical Un dressing and it's a book about a bookstore that won't take money for books so if you want to buy a book in this bookstore you have to bring a book and trade for it and of course that leads to the whole idea of like well how much is this book worth and I don't know if um, the things that were said in the book is Oyayami's opinions or not but hopscotch definitely is going to get you a lot of books apparently anyway so it is about a new employee that works at this bookstore and she has uh she was one day she found all these little pieces of paper that is stuck in all the different nooks and crannies in the bookstore and when she unfold these papers she realized that they were they form a book and it's like a story and somebody has somehow maybe ripped all the pages out of a book and stuck it everywhere and the book is about some sort of like 
love affair in Prague, like a historical fiction type thing. So Hero was enjoying this first chapter when she got to the end of the story, uh, end of the chapter, and the last line was, where are you? Wait, what? That doesn't fit the story at all. That's not like the line doesn't fit. And not only that, it, why does Hero feel like the book is talking to her for some reason, asking her where she is? Well, Hero thought, you know what? Time to go to bed. I'm clearly too tired for this. We'll continue tomorrow. But the next day, when she finally got back to the B&B after getting lost in the city and have to be transported back to her B&B in a wheelbarrow, don't ask, she opens up the book and wait, it is no longer a book about some secret love affair that she was reading yet last night. Now it is a book about a judge. What is happening is the question that Hero asked herself and also the question that all the readers as we are reading throughout this whole book, we'll be asking a lot. I have barely scratched the surface of this banana pants There are going to be letter in, letters in the mail that follow you no matter where you go. There are going to be doppelgangers. There are going to be snow globes that you can customize. And you can put whatever inside that you want to shake away and get rid of from your life. There's going to be marriage certificates that are taped to your door. They're going to be a mole person and so many other delightful detours in this book. That definitely some of the story threads, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I can't follow it. And you just have to shrug your shoulders and just move on because it feels like you're never going to figure out and that is okay. But I love this whole like sort of stories within a story kind of structure, you know, like the ever-changing kind of paradoxical undressing that book. And then it just tells a different story every single time someone opens the book about a different time in um, the history of Prague. That was really, really great. I love Oyayami's writing. Just like there's so much, like so many good lines. Like one of the, the lines that she said was like, you know, she was reading and it's reading that leaves paper cuts in your mind I'm like oh that is just such a beautiful line it is just the kind of book that I love um, Publisher Weekly gave it a star review call it a meta textual masterpiece whatever that means and Kirk has said of Oyayami she's like the heir of to Calvino and Borges so with that obligatory uh, mention of Italo Calvino I shall end my review here and encourage all of you who likes maximum banana pants to check out this book which is Parasol, Ag Parasol Against the Axe by Helen Oyayami. Oh, I love Helen Oyayami. I absolutely love Gingerbread. I've loved everything I've read of hers. So I definitely have to pick that up when it comes out in March. Thank you, Virginia. So next, I'm going to go. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to talk about my book today. It is by N.K. Jemison, one of my favorite authors writing today. Um, while I've talked before about how much I love her fantasy trilogy, The Broken Earth, today I want to talk about a lesser known series of hers, the Dreamblood duology, specifically the first book, The Killing Moon. The Killing Moon takes place in a socially stratified city-state based off of ancient Egypt, a place that draws its magic from the power and emotions carried in the dreams of its people. The city-state of Gujara city of the worshippers of the dream goddess Hananja, is known for being peaceful. Peace is the greatest good that it strives for. It is known for magic, primarily healing magic, using the four dream humors collected from its populace, most respected, and in some cases feared, of the servants of Hananja are the gatherers, who collect dream blood, the most precious of the dream humors from those whose souls they free into the dream world of Inakarek for the last time. Gatherer a hero is one of these chosen few, and we meet him on a night when he is gathering first the soul of an elderly man, who sees his gathering as a blessing, something that frees him from the suffering of his earthly life. The gathering goes smoothly, and a hero is energized enough that he believes he can accomplish a second before the night is through. His second target is an outlander, someone not from the city-state. It isn't common, but all who visit Gujara know that they may become a candidate for gathering, 
so a hero feels no reservations about collecting the man. He's having a nightmare, though, and when the hero tries to calm him, he is instead thrown off his rhythm by the man having a true seeing, speaking a hero's true name and telling him, cryptically, they're using you. A hero fumbles the gathering, sending the man's spirit hurtling into a realm of nightmares, and horrified, hurries back to his brothers in the Hatawa to meditate and attempt to regain some of his lost peace. Meanwhile, we meet the second of our major cast, Sunandi. She is an outlander, a speaker from the neighboring country of Kiswa, here as an ambassador and to learn what she can about the various goings-on in Gujara. She has a conversation with the prince of Gujara, their head of state, where they flirt but don't exchange much information. After she returns to her rooms, however, she meets with her ward, a, a young northern girl named Lin, who has found something important, proof that Tsunandi's mentor, who died months ago, was most likely assassinated for what he had found out, that a reaper might be stalking Gujara, a rogue gatherer who kills not for the sake of peace, but to sate his own desires. Finally, we meet with Nijiri, a young acolyte of the Hatawa. He is in a training session, sparring with four members of the Sentinels, the martial branch of the followers of Hananja. Unarmed, he does his best to coolly consider the situation and bursts into action. He manages to defeat two of the Sentinels, but the other two subdue him in the end. Still, this is seen as enough. He has passed the test, and to his surprise, the superior of their order is there to congratulate him. As he had hoped, as he has been training for since he was a child, he is going to become an apprentice of the Gatherer's Order. With a young man's excitement and enthusiasm, he goes to clean himself up for the oath-taking ceremony. Once his oaths are taken, Najiri assumes he will be taken under the wing of a hero, but is told that a hero is in seclusion, stricken with doubt over his mistake in gathering the foreigner's soul the night before. Najiri, with a little pride and a lot of determination, states that he will have a hero as his mentor, no matter what. Sunandi meets shortly thereafter with a local noble, who seems ill at ease from the moment she arrives. When he is able to get her alone after dinner, the reason becomes clear. He is in charge of the prison in Gujara, which holds few prisoners, as gatherers take care of the most dangerous and corrupt people. But those few prisoners have been dying. Not just dying, but dying horribly in their sleep, so they are left with horrifying rictus screams in death. The noble warns Sunandi that she will be in danger knowing this, and he knows that he is in danger as well. He begs her to use this information to try and prevent the war that might break out if the information gets out. A hero is approached by his superior in his solitude and is told that he has a gathering to complete. There are too few gatherers and he is needed. The one he is being sent to gather is a foreigner, a Kiswati noblewoman named Sunandi, who has been accused of spying and fomenting corruption and war in Gujara. A hero agrees, reluctantly, and decides to take Nijiri along as a form of training in the gatherer's path. When they arrive to gather Sunandi, however, Lin is waiting. Both Lin and Sunandi fight the gatherers to a standstill, and Sunandi remarks that the noble she visited was right. She just didn't expect the assassins to show up so quickly. A hero and Nijiri are both insulted by this insinuation, but also intrigued. Why would she assume she's being assassinated? The story about the Reaper on the Loose comes out, and while a hero and Najiri are resistant to believing Sunandi, they eventually decide that her gathering can wait until they know more information about what's going on, as a Reaper on the Loose could mean catastrophe, both inside and outside of Gujara. But the corruption in Gujara may go deeper than any of them realize. Will a hero, Najiri, and Sunandi be able to find and stop the Reaper before the peace of Gujara is broken beyond repair? I really like this duology, and I think that it stands up well with N.K. Jemisin's other works. The magic system is fascinating, and the world building is lush and intriguing. Jemisin does not hold the reader's hand, though, throwing you into the deep end, as it were, without fully explaining or directly explaining much of the culture and magic system to you, and leaving a lot of the reader to learn through inference. The core mystery of the book is compelling, and the characters are well realized. Ihiru, Sanandi, and Najiri all have different perspectives and drives that cast interesting lights on each other, and honestly, this book is just a treat to read as a fantasy lover. If you like fantasy and you want something a little different from the largely Germanic and British-inspired fare out there, Jemison's Gujara is one world you should definitely dive into. 
All right. So now it is time for our existential question of the episode. And we're going light and simple today. So what, when you are reading, when you are settling down just to enjoy a good book, what is your hot beverage of choice? It's not a hard question. Al already is told. <laughs> I mean, it's like almost like too obvious. Well, for me, absolutely black coffee, black coffee all the way, always black coffee, whether I'm reading or not, doesn't matter any time of the day, black coffee. I like a good black coffee in the morning, if I'm reading in the morning. Um, but if it's like an afternoon evening read, I'm a rooibos tea kind of gal. <laughs> I like like an African red rooibos tea, something that's like very warm and heartwarming and cozy. You're making a face, Kareen. <laughs> smells like cough syrup. Like, <laughs> yeah, rooibos tea smells like cough syrup. Well, it doesn't taste like cough syrup. What do you? What would you okay. drink, Kareen? Um, again, like Emma, I've got like my my afternoon routine and my evening routine. If it's the afternoon, I take the long, long walk to my favorite little like bakery coffee shop to get my iced Americano with four shots of espresso and then an, an embarrassing amount of milk. Um, and then in the evening, I have what I call my night tea because like nighty and then like that's kind of funny and yeah. I built myself and it's so cute. Um, and then I have my little cup of tea, which invariably, uh, black tea obviously with milk um which invariably becomes cold before i finish it and so what i usually end up drinking is like lukewarm to stone cold tea and you're making fun of my tea choices mine at least starts better i don't add milk to my tea <laughs> i gotta say i'm similar to kareen's evening uh choices i always like to sit down with a cup of earl grey tea hot with a uh, little bit of a splash of milk and just that's so comforting to me earl grey tea is the tea that i started drinking as a little kid um which was as a little kid it was just milk with like you dipped the tea bag into it briefly and then it slowly worked up and to actually having tea um so earl grey tea is like my comfort tea and it really just puts me in the mood for a good book. See, Al knows. Describe it as milk with a little bit of coffee, Corinne. Do not say coffee because that's just like blasphemous to like the whole idea of coffee. You are drinking milk with a hint of coffee on the top of like two droplets of it, probably. <laughs> it's brown. It's Virginia. coffee. I'm with Virginia on this one. All right, I did not know this would be as divisive a topic as it turned out to be. But moving on, um, Corrine, what book do you have for us? Yeah, so uh, this is my first podcast back from my vacation where every Thursday night I just like lived. Um, instead of forcing myself to read a book in a very short amount of time on a deadline. And so I had forgotten sometimes the pitfalls of this particular approach to this podcast is that if you choose a book that ends up to be terrible, you're kind of in a fix. So I did take home a book that I've been kind of looking forward to and then started it and then finished it and then sat on my bed at like midnight and then realized this book was really bad and I don't think I can talk about it. Um, so I was in a little bit of a fix um, because I like to read something fresh and new for the podcast. Otherwise, it feels like cheating. So I very quickly Googled novellas, um, figuring that I could knock something out of the park real fast before it, the sun came up. And I discovered that Toni Morrison, Nobel Prize winner of literature, National Book Award winner, Pulitzer winner, had written a novella, which was uh, her 10th novel published in 20... Hmm, my handwriting gets a little legible around here. We're going to say 2012. Um, and so I thought, sure, I can finish this. Um... Again, to my everlasting shame on one of our previous podcasts, we talked about authors that we'd always meant to read and just kind of never got around to. And Toni Morrison was mine because I'm 
kind of afraid of her um, in the same way that I'm afraid of like Melville and Tolstoy sometimes in that they're just so big. They're so influential. They're so amazing that I'm afraid that my my tiny brain just won't be able to comprehend it. Um, much like Helen Noemi, which I read and I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, but I was so pleasantly surprised with the Song of Solomon, unpleasantly surprised by the amount of incest, but pleasantly surprised by the writing and the story. And it is a book that I think about a lot and I really enjoyed. And so I was so delighted to be able to kind of dip my toe back in something that's a little bit more contemporary and a little bit um, lesser known than some of her older, more classic works. And so the lovely 169 page novella that I ended up reading um, is Home, uh, again, by the wonderful Toni Morrison. And again, clocking in at a sweet 169 pages. Um, this book packs a lot, a lot into all of those pages. And again, Again, even though I wouldn't say it's a book that you will enjoy in the same way that you're not going to read it with a big smile on your face, um, you are the 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 process of it is really cathartic when you're reading it, as well as there are just sentences or descriptions in there that just, I, I, I as uh, Virginia had quoted, that kind of like rip through your brain like a, a paper cut you just kind of sit up and stop and it's so wonderfully written and so incisive and so perfect that yeah her writing just astounds me every single time even even when I'm reading about things I don't love and so for this particular book um if you can think of a content warning it will be there um this book deals with a lot of big topics um quite wonderfully done but it is a very very heavy book um our book starts in kind of the 1950s and frank money cannot find his shoes he's pretty sure that he had them or that they were somewhere but somewhere in the night he seems to have lost them and somewhere in the night he has seemed to have found himself chained to a bed and currently in a mental hospital we're in the 1950s, and Frank Money is a veteran of the Korean War. He is a black soldier. He has returned home, home in a sense. He's returned back to America, but he refuses to go back to his hometown and all of the ghosts and the living that he would meet there. Frank is originally from Georgia, where he grew up with his beloved sister, C. And they were inseparable. From the moment she was born, he knew that he had responsibility over her because their parents, while present, were mostly too busy working to take care of the small child. And so C became Frank's child in a way. And there's a wonderful, wonderful quote that Again, I started like screenshotting parts of it because it was so good. Their parents were so beat by the time they came home from work. Any affection they showed was like a razor, sharp, short, and thin. Instead, the two children were sent into the care of their grandfather, who was distant and only interested in food, and his wife, Lenore, bitter, angry that she has been thrust with a family when she wanted her freedom. After Frank enlisted and came back, he suffers from blackouts, and this is one of them. But as he wakes up in the hospital, he knows that he has to leave. He has received a letter, a letter from someone named Sarah, who writes about his sister. The message is short, succinct, and terrifying. Come fast, she be dead if you tarry. And so Frank escapes from the hospital and makes his way in a journey from the north back down to his childhood home in the south. The novel follows Frank's journey as he stumbles through the 1950s racism of America, finding kindness and finding harshness. It also goes from different point of views to the people in Frank's orbit. Lily, his ex-lover, who is working her way up to be able to own a home, Lenore, 
his grandfather's wife, who is embittered by what has happened to her, and eventually C, who has survived the terrible childhood of the wicked witch, the wicked stepmother Lenore, only to be caught by Prince, a shuckster, who, again, a brutal line in this book, who only married her for a car. And he was eventually taken into the house of a white doctor who sees her not just as a servant, but as an object of experimentation. As we go through all of these people in Frank's life, eventually his journey comes to a head when he comes to rescue his sister, the only family he has ever known. This book tackles a lot of big themes. I think it's actually a beautiful look at a sibling relationship, which unlike Song of Solomon didn't end in incest, which was nice. Um, it talks about the war and the trauma of war, the, the horribleness of happened there. At the end, it kind of turns into a, a beautiful, uplifting message about the healing of womanhood, um, which was unexpected, but kind of nice. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're kind of looking for an introduction to the themes that Toni Morrison um, tackles in her writing, I would really recommend this one. Again, it's very short. It's very touching. Um, there are scenes of it that are going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Um, in a positive way? I think. I think. Um, but if you are really kind of looking to delve into kind of like the great Black thinkers, the great Black writers, and are a little intimidated, I am here to tell you that you will be so richly rewarded if you just kind of take that that first step and, and let go of kind of like the labels or hangups that you might have about kind of engaging with these magnificent thinkers because you'll come away like so much richer and and so um, so inspired by what what people can do with like simple English words that we're all speaking right now. Um, so I would definitely, definitely recommend if you're kind of looking into kind of like a first foray into Toni Morrison and looking for something short. Um, and again, you missed the book display at the library, which was short novels uh, for the beginning of the year. Um, definitely recommend Toni Morrison's Home. Wow, that sounds like a great entry point into Toni Morrison's body of work. I will definitely have to pick that up when I am ready for a little bit of soul crushing, but in a good way. Yeah. Um. So finally, we go to Emma. Emma, what have you got for us today? All righty. So for this week's Black History Month episode, um, rather than reading a work of fiction by a Black author, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to read something that kind of captures Black history and Black excellence, um, specifically in America. Um, and I kind of had a similar uh, experience as Virginia, where I picked an author that I has been on my radar for a really long time. I've read like little snippets of some of this author's essays and some of his poetry before, but I haven't fully delved into any of his books yet. And so this I kind of took as an opportunity to get into some of his writing for the first time. Um, and I really enjoyed a lot of the work of his that I've looked at in the past. Like I said, he does poetry, he does essays, um, and a lot of his writing is kind of cultural critiques on American music and pop culture, which I think is really fascinating. Um, I actually had the pleasure of seeing this author speak live on a book tour a few years ago, and he has just like such a wonderful and kind of like heartwarming and welcoming presence. He's very calm, he's very peaceful, yet he's also extremely captivating. And the way that he speaks, whether he's reading from one of his books or whether he's just kind of addressing the audience, um, it sounds like poetry. He just has this very lyrical way of speaking that I find really fascinating. Um, and I have spoken about him on the podcast before. One of his books that's coming out in March of 2024 was on my top upcoming books of 2024 list. Um, that one is an autobiographical essay collection kind of about sports. Um, and so the author is Hanif Abdurraqib. And the book that I read this week is uh, kind of, it, it's called A Little Devil in America, Notes and Praise of Black Performance. And so it's kind of a musical performance history. Um, it's like a kind of blend of like cultural essays, cultural commentaries on the history of black performance, um, kind of interconnected with notes, uh, 
from Hanif Abdurraqib's own upbringing and his own childhood and his own experience of Black art and Black music. So it's kind of part cultural commentary, part memoir, um, a really, really fascinating book. So a little bit of info about the author, about Hanif Abdurraqib. He's a poet and essayist from Columbus, Ohio, so he's American. Um, and his first book was a poetry collection that's called The Crown Ain't Worth Much, and it was published in 2016. Um, his book from 2017 is the one I saw him book tour. That one is another essay collection kind of talking about like pop culture commentary, music commentary. Um, and it's called They Can't Kill Us Until like, They Kill Us. That one's really critically acclaimed. Like I said, mostly focuses on music, um, but it has this huge variety of artists that he talks about. He talks about Chance the Rapper and Schoolboy Q. He loves Carly Rae Jepsen, so he talks about her a lot. Uh, talks about My Chemical Romance and pop punk. So there's huge range going on here. Um, and uh, really, really fascinating writing. Uh, it's been He's been described by critics as his writing is mesmerizing and deeply perceptive, which I think is a really accurate take. Um, and one of my favorite things about his works kind of as a whole is how he um, he interconnects personal anecdotes about his own upbringing, about his own experience, especially his experience growing up as a Black Muslim in America um, with commentary on music and pop culture. And you can tell that he is just like so, so deeply passionate about the music and the culture that he writes on. Um, which is really, really cool. So his works aren't entirely autobiographical, nor are they entirely cultural critiques. They're poetry mixed with nonfiction. They're lyrical and nuanced, in addition to being extremely informative pieces of cultural history. Um, and I usually really like books that kind of bleed across genres like that, which is, for me, one of the biggest appeals to reading um, Hanif Abdurraqib's work. So a little bit about this book, about A Little Devil in America. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of his work kind of blends different genres, blends history with memoir. And in this book, he tells a broad history of Black excellence in performing arts all across America um, with interjections of his own experiences with art growing up. The book opens talking about dance marathons, which I had very little interest in learning about and knew pretty much nothing about going into it. Um, but I hadn't realized that dance marathons began in the 1920s and 30s as a way, they kind of started in rural America as a way of like bringing communities together, kind of creating this, um, this like cultural community, as well as kind of being a way for people to make money because people could make could earn prize money by uh, competing in them. And since people would get fed during them, it was an easy way to score a free meal, especially during the Great Depression. So um, it was cool to learn about the history of something that I've never really cared about, but actually was kind of fascinating to learn about. Um, and Abdurraqib interrupts his history of dance marathons to talk about his own experience with dancing with these kind of like community collective dance experiences when he was in high school. So he goes in to say that, um, during when he was in school, teachers at the school realized that students who had cars who were upperclassmen in the high school would leave campus during lunch and there was pretty much no way to guarantee that they would come back. So what they would do to incentivize the students coming back to school and going to their afternoon classes is they would open up the auditorium during lunch, they would turn all the lights off and they would allow the students to blast music and just dance. And so in the middle of the school day, his school auditorium would turn into this like dance club. And although his high school was um was mixed, there were white folks, there were black folks, there were folks of all races there. Um, it was mostly the black students who participated in these midday dances. And uh, Hanif Abdurraqib talks about how they kind of offered this opportunity for young people, including him, to freely express themselves free of judgment in this dark auditorium where they could just dance all their feelings out and not worry about other people judging or looking at them. Um, and it created this really great sense of community in his school. So that was very cool. Um, the book continues on this similar pattern where he talks about this historical moment in Black history um, and in Black like performance history specifically and interconnects them with commentaries about his own experience, with a personal story about his own life and how his own experience connects to that history. Um, so it's really, really cool. It's more of a collective history of Black experience in the arts than it is these standalone essays or pieces of a memoir. Um, going along with the theme of music and dance, each section of the book is called a movement and it touches on different themes. Um, some of the themes he has are performing miracles, suspending disbelief, country and provenance, um, family and closeness and home, and then remembering. 
So each section begins with a short essay that's kind of written in a stream of consciousness called On Times I Have Forced Myself to Dance, where Abdurraqib in one long breath, in one kind of really long run-on sentence, reminisces on his own experiences of Blackness in his youth. So these are kind of interesting interjections that he includes at the beginning of each chapter. They read more like confessional poetry than they do like nonfiction. And yet they have that similar kind of lyrical tone that he writes with even when he's recollecting history, even when he is writing just straight up nonfiction. Um, so it's it's cool how that tone is kind of carried throughout the entire book. Um, throughout the book, Abdurraqib transitions seamlessly between subjects. One moment he's talking about Don Cornelius, the guy who started Soul Train and the origins of Soul Train. And the next he's recounting an unfortunate incident where he himself had fallen backwards down a staircase while doing the moonwalk. So there's these cool connections between the history of dance, the history of Black performing arts, and his own kind of failures as he would attempt to dance as a kid. Um, but it's really it's really fun how he's kind of interconnecting these experiences together. Um, he effortlessly weaves stories of life and death, resilience and heartache with praises on the history of Black music and dance performance with a culturally relevant commentary on race relations in America. That's kind of an overall theme of the book. So I would really recommend this book if you're a fan of cultural criticism, if you're a fan of writing on music and performing arts, or if you're just a fan of memoir. Um, although the book is less memoir and more anecdotal notes on the author's lived experience, I think you do really learn about Abdurraqib's own experience in the book, as you do kind of in all of his um, all of his nonfiction writing. I'd recommend it if you really like lyrical poetry or lyrical writing, um, or if you just want to read a nonfiction that's really beautiful, that's really beautifully written. Um, I'd also recommend um, many of Abdurraqib's other books that I've looked into. He, like I said before, he has a, um, a poetry collection that was his first book called The Crown Ain't Worth Much. And another really fascinating uh, essay collection on music history and music criticism. And that one is less about the history of a specific type of music, more just about music in general. Um, that one's They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us. And he also has that new book that's coming out in March that I'm very excited about. Um, that one is called There's Always This Year, and it's more about his own experience, but interconnected with um, sports. He talks a lot about basketball in that one. So if you're a sports fan, um, and if you want to read more about Abdurraqib's own childhood experiences, I would really recommend checking out that one when it comes out in March. Um, so kind of to wrap up, if you're interested in checking out something that's really sharp and provocative, commentary on music and performance, or if you just want to learn a bit more about the history of Black performance and Black art in the United States, I would really recommend A Little Devil in America by Hanif Abdurraqib. Thank you, Emma. That sounds like a really interesting read, and I always love it when we get a little bit of nonfiction on the podcast. So... That brings us to the end of our episode for today. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of the great Black creators that we have brought to the table. And I hope that you go out and find some great Black creators to read this month as well. So on that happy note, uh, goodbye, everyone, and see you next week. Mm -hmm.